All right, welcome to the last lecture of the year, or for you, the 10th lecture of the year, a uh, different year. Um, well, we got two more days of celebrities dying, so let's cross our fingers, okay, that the right ones do. Uh, this is 21st century chess. If I'm not mistaken, which I probably am, this is the last one. Aren't they changing the schedule? Yeah, yeah, they're changing everything. There's gonna be a new lecture at this time next week on something else by somebody else, so who cares? Um, the lecture subject today is Maximilian Liu, and at one point, about a year ago, year and a half ago, less than a year ago, he was the youngest US master ever, which is sort of like being the best hockey player in Idaho. And uh, since then, it's been broken at least once. I think there's a nine-year-old or eight-year-old who's a master now, or a three-year-old or something, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Every year he goes to the World Youth, which has been renamed to the World Cadet, and there's a tournament for older kids now called the World Youth, confusing everybody. And several times he's played in the World Under 8 and the World Under 10, and I think he played in the World Under 12 this year, although he might have played in the World Under 10. And he lives on the West Coast. He's currently 11 years old. He's the highest rated 11 year old in the US. He's top 10 in the world for his age and his USCF rating currently is approximately 2280. I don't have a lot of games that he played recently because it's hard to find games of small children on the internet and in databases. If you do want to find games of small children, you go to chess-db.com and all the kids' games are there. So I found the best games that he played, although some of them, he was seven and eight years old at the time. So, okay, now the first one, is interesting, especially for our weaker players in the audience and uh, at home, because White fell into a trap that I was teaching my chess camp this week. And I remember after teaching it, one of the students fell into it like five minutes later. So he learned real fast, okay? Just like you will at home. Okay, and here, White played the well-known blunder, Bishop E3, developing pieces, don't do that, okay? Now, of course, White is seven years old, so I'll give him a break, okay? And what this does, it puts the bishop and knight in the kind of position where a pawn can fork them, and we see this often in this kind of structure and often in double king pawn structures. Maximilian Liu was quick to take advantage, plays d5, and then d4, winning a piece. And normally, I would end things now, because you win a piece, but it's the under eight, so you can still toss a coin, and it's not clear who's gonna win. It's sort of like if you come to our chess club and you play chess downstairs, winning and losing a queen doesn't mean very much, okay? Most of the players here have yet to attain beginner status, and most of them are here right now watching my lecture. Okay, so bishop retreats, and we get a position where black's a piece up. The reason I like this is black didn't say, oh, I'm a piece up. I think I'll just take a nap now. He is seven, he should take a nap. Okay. But instead, he played more tactics and even trickier until white had nothing left. So in this position, g3, a terrible move, he played the move rook d8. I always tell my students and onlookers and my homeless friends, when a rook, and usually they're the same people, the rook and the queen are lined up, is that good for the rook or the queen? Now the, the audience doesn't know. It's good for the rook. So the queen should be like, hmm, I don't like that rook opposite my queen. But again, this is the under eight, so they don't care about nothing. So king g2, solid, overlooking. Well, what's the move? Knight e4, and you can't take the knight because you lose your queen. I mean, you could. Okay, so black is playing more tactics, hooray. Okay, and the game continues, unfortunately. Okay, now C3 is pretty weak. Whoa, it's weaker than I thought. Wow, and we're attacking it. So black never lets up. Black doesn't say all about material, I'll just stop thinking. He keeps playing more and more tactics because he's a little kid, so that's what he does. Okay, queen C7, strange move. White trades queens to make sure he loses the quickest. Okay, because you don't want to you know, get too many good moves. And the game ended in sort of a funny way. I mean, funny if you have the black pieces. 
rook b1. Notice, if black plays rook takes knight, which most of you would play, <laughs> then checkmate coming soon. And when my son was four, this was a typical game that he would play. He would take everything, his opponent would have one rook or one queen left, and then mate was coming. Then my son started playing h6 and h5, and then he stopped getting mated. Okay. Instead, he can win the knight, but not by taking it, by playing. So many good answers. Bishop e4, pinning the knight to the rook. So even though black won a piece really quickly, he kept playing more tactics as the game continued because they worked, and because he was seven, you know, he was like, oh boy, I got all these tactical tricks. And that was in a world championship. That was in the United Arab Emirates. I was actually there. I don't think I was coaching, but I think I coached him the next year. Maybe I coached him there. Okay, thank you for coming. No. All right, more brilliant wins from Maximilian Liu against Zhu. Okay, and this is actually very nice. This is actually in the same tournament. Notice that black is in check, something my chess campers never notice. Their kings are in check 10, 20 moves in a row. Okay, black played the obvious move. King h8. And now, in a very strange happenstance, white played the best move, and it's not easy to find. I was shocked. I've never seen anybody play the best move. I couldn't believe it. Never in all my years. Rook e7 can be played, and there's nothing wrong with it, but there's actually a slightly better move. I think after rook e7, I can play knight f5? I think I can play that. But you're two-thirds correct, which is normal in my class. How's that two-thirds correct? That's correct, yeah. Anybody who gets the right answer doesn't have to learn fractions. All right, Claudio said the right answer, then shook his head. So say it again. Yeah, queen e7. Best by test. Now the truth hurts. White threatens, queen takes knight mate, and bishop takes knight mate. If you play rook to g8, you lose for lots of reasons. The main reason is bishop takes knight check and your rook is overworked. So act, queen e7 is a really nice move for somebody who is either seven or eight, because that's sort of like a creeping move. That's like a Karpov move. Queen e7, what? I would never play queen e7, even if I was shown the position now. Okay, so black traded, which was correct. Now, good luck playing black. So black played rook g8, and white said yum, 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 knight f5. And okay, here black ended up losing because he took one of the bishops. He was down the exchange for nothing, and he lost due to the brilliant technique of a young man. But I was really impressed with queen e7, especially when I turned my engine on and said queen e7 was the best move. I was like, what? Okay, proving he was using a computer to cheat. No, I'm kidding. Okay, also in the same tournament, he was playing another American player. That's one of the problems we have in the world championship. It's a world championship and you're trying to get medals for your country, but sometimes the best players are from our country so they get paired, so there's nothing you can do. And in fact, they don't do anything to not pair them. It's actually illegal in FIDE tournaments to do that. Although in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, that was always done in the US. They always changed the pairings to pair the right people. And Fide said, you can't do that. You can't say, well, he needs a foreign GM to get a GM norm, so we're gonna pair him with that guy. You can't do that. You gotta just make legal pairings. So occasionally, Americans play Americans. There's nothing we can do. So we have Lou versus Wu. Okay, and the winner of the game said woohoo because he didn't know who his opponent was and he lost. So I'll get that joke later. Okay, in fact, Logan was at our chess club here two weeks ago playing in a tournament. I saw him here. And you know who else was playing? Rochelle Wu and Sijing Wu, not related to Logan Wu, but they're brother and sister. And, and Rochelle Wu, I did a lecture on her, even though you'll deny it, very recently, right? Yeah, Rochelle Wu. Yeah, you don't even deny it. Wow. You denied something else I did. Okay, here, White played an amazing move, confusing his opponent and me. He played the longest move on the board, 
So I give him a hint. Don't have to know how to play chess to get it. What's the longest move? What's that? Bishop B8. Bishop B8, confusing the audience. Yeah. And Black was like, Bishop B8, that doesn't do nothing. And in fact, this position, if you put it on an engine, says it's equal. And Black can play reasonable moves and be equal, such as A5, stopping Knight B4 check, or Bishop C8, so the king can escape to b7. And the bishop might go to e6 or f5. Instead, black was very greedy, as most eight-year-olds are. And he went yum, yum, yum. Rook takes g2, overlooking the opponent's threats. And again, this is what I like about Maximilian Liu. When he has a winning position, he doesn't say, oh, I'm winning. Now I'll just play boring and win. He wins the quickest way, the most accurate way. Knight b4 check, and now black has a problem. The king doesn't have many squares. If king goes to whatever square that is, c5, I see mate in two. Maybe there's a quicker mate, but I doubt it. And so he didn't do that, play king b6. And white played the obvious. Rook to d6, right. Bishop c6 loses a piece, so he played king a5. Maybe he thought he was safe here. Oh. Okay, and now white made a move shocking everybody here. Man, I'll bet you it shocked black. If I was black and my opponent did this, I'd be really unhappy. I would know that they're crazy or they're winning. Usually when they're higher rated, they're winning. So then you're like, uh-oh. It's the one move you would never play. That's the winning move. Rook takes a6. Bishop c7 check. Rook takes a6 and bishop c7 check. Yeah, they, they both win. Then rook a6 check. A move I would never think of. Obviously, he could take first, but that would his opponent could get sick then. So he did that. Rook a6. Rook a6 isn't necessary, but that's, that way when you play the guy again, they're like, oh man, that's the guy who played rook a6 against me. So then, you know, you're like, whoa. Yeah, and again, when I'm playing small children, I trade all the pieces, I get to an ending where I'm slightly better. Can, can you see that? Can you zoom in? Slightly better. And, that, and then they blunder on move 75 and I win. When you decide, I'm better than a seven-year-old, I'm going to play tactically and beat them, that's not good. Seven and eight-year-olds are good at tactics. At long positional endings, usually not so good. I'm the opposite. My tactics are suspicious, but if the game's 90 moves and I'm slightly better, I can put the old man clamps on. So rook takes a6 check there. B3 check. Black played the best move. King a3, knight c2 check, black played the best move, and bishop a d6 check. The truth hurts. So I think black regrets taking this pawn on g2. And you can see why white was the youngest master ever in the US, sacrificing all his pieces in the ending to mate his opponent. Man, the truth hurts. So it's funny how I explain this to a lot of people, but they, they don't understand usually. They think when player A plays player B, and player A is better than player B, that the reason they're better is they get an advantage out of the opening, then they increase their advantage due to the superior play, and eventually player B succumbs to player A's great play. What usually happens when player A beats player B is the position is about equal, player A never makes a blunder, and player B blunders once or twice a game, and when player B blunders, player A goes, oh boy. In this position, if black had played bishop c8 or a5, the computer says it's equal, and after rook g2, black has to resign because his king just gets totally crushed. Of course, a5 prevents knight b4, or the drunken knight a4, and bishop c8 allows the king to escape. But it was an end game Black had a rook on the seventh rank, 
and he was very happy to take everything. He didn't think, it's an end game, I'm going to get mated. But he should have been thinking that. By the way, this end of the game reminds me of your favorite game, Kasparov Topolov, the famous game. Was that 99? Yeah. Man, you said yeah like you knew. I like that. Yeah. Do I believe him? Should I believe you? No, 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 no. Even you don't believe you. Yeah. Anyway, in that game, Kasparov sacrificed all his pieces and Topolov's king ran up the board and eventually Kasparov won. So that was a very nice, unfortunately, it was against an American. Boo. Okay. And least but not last, we have this game. This is from the World Youth in 2014. Hmm. So this was South Africa. Okay, that's why I like to be a coach, that I get to go to a different country every time. Okay, and I think this was South Africa 2014, pretty sure. Anyway, white is a pawn up because I said so. I counted the pawns before the lecture. Good prep. Seven to six. And in my opinion, you may disagree, white's open rooks are on the D file and black's rooks are behind a pawn. So I like white's pawn advantage and I like the fact that white's rooks are better than black's. Okay, now here uh, black played a very risky move, knight g5. He wanted to put pressure on e4, possibly sacrifice a piece and attack the white king. This is actually very funny. This is a very complicated example of overworked. Now, if you go to the world's youth, or you go to a kids tournament, a scholastic tournament, the nationals, or you look at the FIDE ratings, that's very misleading. Most of the kids who have FIDE ratings have played very few games that are FIDE rated, just like you. Okay, Claudio, 2200 USCF, how many FIDE rated games have you played in the last three years? Not many. Yeah. So if you play eight games that are FIDE rated and 200 games that are USCF rated, your FIDE rating is not very accurate. So you can see here, Maximilian Liu, 1,700, his opponent, 2,000, but that doesn't mean his opponent's better than him. That means his opponent's probably played a lot of FIDE rated games and he hasn't. So normally in the world youth, the US players gain a lot of rating points because they don't play a lot of FIDE rated tournaments they play a lot of USCF rated tournaments. And it's changing over the last few years that tournaments are rated both ways. But still for the most part, for every FIDE rated game they play, they play 20 USCF rated games. Their FIDE ratings aren't accurate. For example, there's a kid that I coach every year who's a V Friedman's private student. She's 2,040 USCF and she's 1,500 FIDE. She's played maybe 40 FIDE rated games in her life and maybe 1,000 USCF. So her FIDE rating is not accurate. Um, so when she plays in the World Youth, her FIDE rating goes up a lot. Okay, so in this position, White did something that I love to teach because it was featured prominently in one of my favorite games with Fidel Corrales Jimenez, which I'm sure you've all memorized. They, they didn't memorize it. Okay, and that game, uh, it was called Removing the Guard and Overworked. This position, and a big surprise to the audience, this rook is overworked. It's doing two things. It's stopping rook d7, and it's defending the pawn on c5. And white took advantage of that by playing what move? Knight takes c5. Not only does that win a pawn, if black was going to sacrifice on e4, sound or not, he's not anymore, now, not only did white win a pawn, white can take this bishop, white can play rook d7 anyway. Okay, so black took the knight, and now black made an unusual decision, but since he's a small child, it's not that unusual. Um, I would move my queen away, and then I would lose. Man, he's getting crushed over here. Maybe actually his decision's better. Maybe resigning is better. Yeah, because his rook's hanging too, man. Man, knight c5 was better than I thought. What's funny is, in this position, black is defending against knight c5, but it's not a threat. This is called the Ken West syndrome. And Grandmaster Ken West 
is currently playing in Vegas and getting recognized. He was posting on Facebook, I'm walking in Vegas, and they're like, you're Ken West? And he's like, yeah. You're the Ken West? And he's like, I'm a Ken West, yeah. So Ken West and Mike Comer, irrespective of their playing ability, get recognized all over the country because of our videos. Man, that was calling, saying he has ability, that was something. Okay, I shouldn't lie so much on camera. Okay, so here, since this pawn is defended, Ken West would tell me, that pawn's defended, I don't even think about it anymore. Then he moves away the defensive piece, and he's like, oh yeah, that's right. Darn. Okay, that happens to him all the time. And, well, it's strange to look at the move knight takes c5 when you're down a pawn and you're trying to get play. This is what I like about Maximilian Liu. He doesn't care what the material situation is. He looks for the most incisive, correct move. He doesn't say like, oh, I'm winning. I'll just be really careful like I would do. He plays like he's a little kid. Why does he do that? Oh, yeah, that's right. He's nine. Okay. So knight takes c5, rook d7. Black has a lot of pieces hanging. So he played rook c7. And now he has a rook and a knight for a queen. Not quite enough. And white has two extra pawns. H4. Again, a lot of players, including me, are afraid when they're playing because I'm winning and I know I'm winning. I don't want to allow any tricks. So the move that allows the least number of tricks is bishop takes g5. If my opponent has no pieces, they have no tricks. But this kid's nine, you don't care about that. He like calculates, figures it out, and plays the best move. His opponent plays for tricks. Rook takes e4. And the computer says white can just play pawn takes rook. And then after taking on e4, that's not sufficient to defense. But he just took the knight, and now he's threatening the rook. Rook e2 check, king f1, rook takes pawn, trades the rooks. And as you can see, white has a queen for a rook. So in junior chess, there's very little resigning. I see games where the players are 2,000, 2,200, 2,300, and they play till mate, sort of like little kids do when they're down two queens and a rook or downstairs in our club when anybody's playing. Um, but here, black actually resigned. Now, what's funny about that is when I'm coaching the world youth and a kid wins a game, our kid, and I'm looking at his game, he has like an extra queen, an extra rook, and I'm like, all right. And he's like, no, let me show you the rest. And I'm like, well, you're up a queen and a rook. He's like, yeah, watch this mate that I did. Okay. So I don't... Certain players like John Fedorowicz and Gregory Kaidanov, they, they don't want to see any of that. When you're up a queen and your opponent's not resigning, a lot of grandmasters are like, why, why are you showing me this? Like, you're up a queen. But kids love to actually like when their opponent doesn't resign. They get to really checkmate them. Um, in this position, black is rated over 2,000, and he's down a queen for a rook, so he resigned. Actually, the opposite colored bishops help white because white can start an attack on the dark squares, and this bishop and this rook aren't going to defend. And a queen and a bishop are pretty convincing at checkmating a king when there's no defense. So in one of the few instances at the world youth, somebody actually resigned when they were supposed to. I would never resign, but I'm different. I'm not a youth player. So, so those were Ma some of Max's best games that he played at world youth tournaments. He also likes to play at the National High School and, I'm sorry, not National High School, National Junior High School and the Super Nationals, which I believe are next year. Well, for you this year. Yeah, I think they're coming up. The Super Nationals, not to scare the adults in the room, and you will be scared. It's where they take all the Nationals and put them in one room at the same time. They do it every four years. They get between five and 6,000 kids, and it's in one room at one hotel. So if you want to eat at that hotel, good luck. If you want to find your board, good luck. If you want to not run into parents and coaches you hate, good luck. You're going to run into them. If you want to find what floor you're on, no. Okay. I, I, I've, been, I've been to one once. It was scary. I wasn't even playing because I was 40 years too old. But those are scary events. And Maximilian Liu is always fighting for first place in his grade, 
in his section, in the Super Nationals, and at the World Youth, he's going to win a medal soon. I don't think he's won a medal yet, but he's been really close. Fourth place, fifth place. They give medals to the top three. And he's one of the top ten players in the world for his age every year. He almost always goes to the World Youth, and I think he's going to win a medal soon. So replay this video after the next World Youth, which I believe for him is going to be in Brazil. So I'll see you guys from Brazil. And as I was talking earlier, and I told him about all the Brazilians, and he said, how many is that? Okay. Now that was a George Bush joke. But. All right, see you guys next year, 2016. It was nice knowing you, but let's go to 2017. Bye, everyone. Yay. Hooray. Yay.